All right, friends, how's it going? Zig coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have Mark Bingham. Um, he is a singer, songwriter, producer, composer, engineer, and has so many credits, I don't even know where to start. But um, I'm going to hit you with a few. Flat Duo Jets, Glenn Barcana, Dr. Michael White, Ed Sanders, The Rebirth Brats Band, John Schofield, MX80, Happy Talk Band. Um, he did some work with... Uh, uh, we, we, we talked about it in the conversation, but he did some work with James Taylor. He did some work with some really cool records, like uh, he did work with Allen Ginsberg, and like way, way, way much more. But that's just a, a mini, mini look into his producing career and composing and writing career. But we're here to talk about his solo career. Uh, Mark is coming out with two new records, one of which is a more ballad record called Gooseneck. And the second of which is Mushroom and Crowd, which is like this psychedelic rock record that hits so many different... I don't even want to call it rock because it goes all over the place. And that's what we're going to listen to. We're going to listen to Mushroom Crowd off Mushroom Crowd, Mark Bingham. Check it. Mark Bingham, Mushroom Crowd off Mushroom Crowd, available off Nouveau Electric Records, wherever you get your music. Um... Before we get to the conversation, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on any of the podcast platforms. It helps me keep talking to cool guests and sharing their insight. And this is it. We're going to get into it. This is me and Mark. <laughs> um, awesome, man. Well, let's kind of get into it. What What was music like in your family? Uh, <clears throat> well, it's kind of non-existent except yep. my dad loved... Um, my dad was in the Navy, and then he loved uh, the Richard Rogers Victory at Sea, and he would blast that on the weekends. And then, oddly enough, he loved Thelonious Monk for some reason, which was, and, and I got to hear that and check that out at a young age, and that, that was good. So, but really, music, you know, it wasn't much, you know. The, my mom's side of the family was like, uh, we call it they were um brethrens which are sort of like right-wing amish <laughs> and uh, you know uh and they were the kind of people who had no dancing no singing no dancing in church and very uptight and wanting to revert to pioneer days so they weren't in the music and so yeah so it was funny it was, wasn't uh but i was and uh you know, I, I had, uh, I got a transistor radio when I was like seven or something and started listening. And uh, that was it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what were you listening to? Oh, whatever, whatever was on the radio, which in those days was a potpourri of any number of things, which could be from, you know, the Fats Domino and the uh, R&B world to the Everly Brothers to all the crazy novelty songs that would be on the radio. And then you also heard all the hit, you know, I heard Doris Day and stuff like that. And as I got older, I started hearing more. I mean, I remember for some reason I heard Stan Kenton and June Christie and these kind of things. And so there was a lot of stuff that I was hearing. Um, and I, I just kept listening, listening, and then by the time I was a teenager, you know, I was really into it. And I remember having a great epiphany being a camp counselor, and it's the middle of the night, and I got my, uh, I'm out there sleeping on the ground with my transistor radio, and the four seasons, a new Four Seasons song came on, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world to look up at the stars and hear this song, Candy Girl, coming out of this teen teeny little speaker. So, you know, I, music was always something that, you know, got me through whatever, you know, I loved, uh, I just, you know, loved to listen to it. And then at some point I, I just picked up um, a guitar and, and I started, I started singing first, you know, yeah. I, I started singing in, with some bands and whatnot, but I never sang in school and I was very, uh, um not liking you know music class in school it all seemed very formal i tried to play saxophone i couldn't do it um you know <laughs> yeah no i i really relate to that because i 
with the uh, music the for me was the same way like I didn't do it in school like in school made it really like how you're saying really like a uh, cookie cutter and like it didn't really seem fun and expressive or anything but that's it's interesting that like um to, it's, it's such a wide variety of music that you were taking in and like they have like outliers like monk you know kind of be like uh some of the starting points in a way that's really cool Monk and, and the other one was interesting was that in that point, you know, I, I'm getting my years mixed up because you know I'm 73. I can't I, I can't remember what if it was 1958 or 1961 or whatever. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> these um, like Johnny Mathis, you would get played right. in the house, and Johnny Mathis was a big thing. And I remember, and and most of us that were, you know, as I started into playing music with people and whatnot. Imitating Johnny Mathis was a thing. Yeah, you could, I, I can almost still do it. I can still sing "Chances Are" and sound like Johnny Mathis. And uh, but the the different part of the world at that point was where we were also, um, you know, the black music was there and and all the doo wop and it there was just a lot of music getting thrown at us that today is you know now they have 58 niche versions of electronic dance music right 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 and i can't i mean i can't <laughs> say i can't tell the difference but i mean i got off the bus at you know jungle and track you know i yeah. don't i just i don't know what these people are hearing and what what the deal is it's this whole subculture that and in those days of course it's like you know when you had three tv stations and, and plus three commercial TV stations plus uh, public broadcasting. You know, everyone watched the same news. Everyone watched the Saturday night fights. There would be, be you know, eight boxing matches on uh, the world. Uh, and and this was across, you know, racial and um, and income and and whatnot. You know, everyone was getting the same kind of info, which is really interesting. And then now, you know, it's completely busted open. But the music, um, you had to dig for the music. But, you know, Randy's radio that was on all night on the AM. So you heard, you heard all, if you were digging for it, you heard, you could hear all kind of amazing things. And so cut to say 1960 three having a band and the Beatles start kicking in. We're also playing John Lee Hooker. We're playing uh, you know, all yeah. the the doo things. We're playing in the still of the night. We're playing, you know, Muddy Waters. We're playing all this stuff went together and then the Beatles and the British invasion come in and then you're playing all that stuff mixed with that. And then at the end of the night you're playing Jay and the Americans, she cried for the uh <laughs> the dancer the chaperones would you know slap your hand off the girl's ass you know so, so you like, know it's like that was yeah it's like the music to me was always i've always seen this you know global music phenomenon as you know ever bubbling you know yeah and and not i've never been much about you know genre was well, it i listening to your music it sounds mm -hmm. like that like, yeah, in 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 the large scale, it is because the genre is just kind of like a, a a rhythm that has a label or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's just really kind of highlighting, hey, hey, we're in this and it's got a clave or whatever. Like, uh, oh yeah, the clave. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, when I went to Cuba to work, uh, one of the first things they did is they, I sat down I, while the band's rehearsing. I played clave for because I had you know it's like. What am I doing producing a band of master Cuban musicians? So sit on the floor and play the clave and show us that at least you can do that. Right. <laughs> well, that's, you know, so, for those like genres, you know, not genres, but for that, yeah. for that culture, that clave is like the center of that whole pulse, you know? Oh, that's it. I mean, you can't do the music without it. That right. everything revolves. So, you know, yeah. But I guess. Like right now on Earth, say, you know, I have this my, this app called Radio Garden. Yeah. And Radio Garden, 
the in the last few weeks I've been listening a lot of music from Madagascar. Oh, and it's really a it's really a mashup of a lot of different stuff and it's very similar to South Louisiana music. They use a rub board, they use accordions. And um so it's interesting to hear and, and but it's totally wild and in, and different and then I so I've been listening to a lot of music um a lot of African music and and oddly enough the African music was so influenced by the 1950s American country music. And this mm. is a very odd one because yeah. when pedal steels and the sort of beautiful old school pentatonic melodies that maybe were, you know, Scottish, I, I don't know where, you know, who yeah. knows? I mean, I could sit there and, you know, go back to the shipping lanes a thousand years ago and tell you why Indian music and Irish music have the same curves. And it's all based around the spice trade, but you know that's yeah. some that's some deep stuff that is it would take you know five hours to talk about. That's fascinating. But, I'm into but, it. But yeah, <laughs> so yeah, so the music, so the music is like that still, and and American music kind of rules the roost. But then a lot of the local places come up with their own versions, which then kicks back and, and influences people in the states you know yeah and so it's 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 really fun still you know to to watch the action yeah that's it's fascinating to see how like how you're saying like it's interesting too with the the build on two points out of that like with um the kind of 50s country music coming out of like africa it's you know it takes it back to like kind of the banjo came from africa you right. know what i mean it's like kind of building off that that in a way in like uh uh, my buddy, he they studied a uh, uh, flamenco music, and uh, sorry, I didn't hear what you said. One more time. The thought. Uh, no, yeah, it was interesting having years ago having sort of teaching music or trying to in New Orleans early on for you know these were like eleven to fourteen year olds. And a lot of the kids just had, who had grown up around the music, really had a lot of, had a thing going. And a lot of kids had nothing going on. I mean, they just were like, and so I think you could take any group of kids from anywhere on earth and probably do this and run the same thing. Those that had, were in, in the middle of the culture had a certain thing. And those that just weren't uh, pushed in that direction didn't know matter how many mardi gras parades they went to they still didn't get time right whereas some kids it seemed like it was just there right you know and so that was that was an interesting thing to look to see you know it is it's is super fascinating i i don't know and like still seeing it now you know and and it's it's funny it's like the kids that get are like yeah whatever you know <laughs> but the kids that want to get it you know they they'll start to really hustle trying to get it <laughs> Um, and get frustrated about it. <laughs> um, so you you start pick you start singing, and you're starting picking up this uh, picking up a guitar. Like, like how long after is a band? Like when you're playing clubs and covers and seeing how this music fits in different areas in real time as you're playing. Well, well, the thing is, the it was. I didn't really know anything about music. I mean, I was write, I was writing songs and I didn't really know the names of the strings on the guitar, you know. I mean, I was just kind of like a not not all there with certain things and um so we started playing I think our first the get, when I started doing this band, I think it was 65 when we first started playing and there were no clubs to play in because we were kids and so I couldn't play in a bar and but there were dances and there were sometimes in you know um the town would have a rec hall or something you know and uh, a meeting hall and there'd be a dance would be in there or there'd be dances at the school and there'd be like you know the junior prom the sophomore hop you know the freshman fling, those kind of things that they yeah. they'd have, uh, and and you know in where I lived then, which was in northern Westchester, New York, 
I have moved from Indiana to there in 1963, I guess. Remember, I'd moved. I, anyway, we moved a whole lot, but I ended up there and, and for high school, and which was great in a large sense because that's where the radio was so incredible there. And I didn't like much else about the area, but I liked the radio. But also when we played, uh, so we could play these shows and we get to play a lot and rehearse a lot. And I remember getting my first amp at Manny's Music in New York City. And and I started, you know, I was lucky. Um, you know, I didn't come from money, but I came from enough middle classness to get a guitar, you know. <laughs> And uh, and so, um, yeah, so we started and, and I think almost everyone in my bands in high school ended up, you know, getting record deals and but none of them stayed in it that long. Uh, but, you know, we just we started doing it and, and I started writing some tunes. So we would play original tunes and then we'd play literally everything that I was talking about a minute ago with just you know we play boom 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 and and we might have heard it at that point you could hear all the stuff that all the brit bands were doing and they were doing covers so then suddenly there were 50 songs that were from the blues and r&b world that were being done by the brits that maybe i'd never heard because they weren't on randy's radio or they weren't on the all night you know, country and blues stations and whatnot. So it was a really eye-opening time for, you know, and, uh, you know, so, yeah, that was, that's what went on until I guess I got out of high school in 67, you know. I find, that's one thing I find fascinating about, like, digging into some kind of older records is you hear a lot of these songs being uh, covered by, a ton of different artists, you know, like in sometimes under different names, like old blues standards. It's like, right. it's like that tradition of the standard was very is still prominent in rock music and like, uh, R and B. And eventually it seems like that tapered off. Like you don't see too many groups doing that now, like kind of doing the due diligence and like, um, I, I guess, I guess you, you see what they do now, but like, uh, it's interesting, like, how prominent that was and, like, how recording a take of, like, Boom, Boom, Boom or recording a take of uh, uh, Hank Williams' tune, like, you know I mean? Just something something that yeah. shows that that's what you started playing. You needed a B-side that was something <laughs> that would, <laughs> would work. Um, but anyway, so, like, moving on, because you started, you were signed to be a record producer at, like, 17, right? So, well... I what I did I was like there was a um, when I lived in in an area that where there were a lot of people a lot of the parents around there were successful people in from um, you know the arts and writers and ad people and tech people from and one of the guys uh, was this guy had uh, my friend had five tape recorders his father worked for at that point, RCA. And so what we started doing was making all these weird tapes with, and we, we figured out, so I don't know how we even learned about it, but we figured out how to make loops, which meant actually cutting the tape and winding them around and then have playing against that. And, you know, we were uh, goofing around with that. And then I made a bunch of recordings and in those recordings ended up going to um, Electra Records, uh, and they gave me a writing deal. And I, you know, and I, a lot of this was based around regular old songs, but within the regular old songs that we had managed to do overdubbing by ganging a whole bunch of tape recorders together, and literally playing one back in the room out into the air, and, yeah, and then miking that and us playing again, going to another tape recorder. So it's kind of a weird setup, but you know, it was I guess they figured that was inventive, and I knew, and I got okay sound. So yeah, so they made me like an apprentice producer, and I got to look basically just see what people were actually doing when they made records. That's and pretty, that was definitely helpful. That's amazing. And then, like, to 
to have that kind of perspective of as this listener, you know, as this listening enthusiast, as as a younger kid to kind of be to be in it and be in that spot again, but now able to kind of like eventually to be able to like move the levers. Um, so yeah. Like, what was what was some of the big takeaways from those early experiences? Well, it was uh, in hindsight is like how much how focused the musicians were say when I finally started doing real sessions and watching real records being made that there was a, even though, you know, they talk about the sixties and everyone doing drugs and this and that, it was really, it was with a few exceptions, which there were tons of drugs. It was pretty well focused. People were trying to play and trying to learn the tunes and trying to play the music together. And I think that had more of, and the recording people were trying to make it sound great in the middle of, you know, I mean, I was there where they got the first eight track at like, you know, yeah. I mean, when I first started, it was like four track. So, so you had a special way you did the four track and I had to go out and do demos and I'd see, I have to record the whole guitar, bass, drums, keyboards onto one track. And there's a reason they used to call people engineers balance engineers because you had to learn how to balance music and then it stayed that way. It wasn't like you put 82 Pro Tools tracks and then come back and, and decide something else later. Right. This was not part of it. Part of it, it was make a decision and move on about music. And so you had to have a certain musicality to understand how much, you know, you want to be able to hear everything. And then and then it had to get layered and then it was going to get mixed again. So you had to be able to see ahead in the process as to where you were going and you were going to get to where you had a whole band on, uh, you know, in mono after you bounced three times and then you were going to add a lead vocal and then, Oh, they're going to put a horn part on. Okay. And then a horn part. And then, so you had a, a, a mono mix that went through six or seven layers. And that was kind of how it, how it went. And those were, that was just making demos. So, yeah. and making records, if you think about like the Doors, the first Doors record, which is no matter what anyone thinks of the Doors is somewhat iconic. I mean, yeah. it's like four track. Now, the thing is what you forget is like, like saying the Beatles made, the Beatles had uh, one in, or two inch four tracks. Right. Yeah. So it's like huge, huge amount of, of fidelity on that stuff. So on a on a fidelity level, I don't know that things have changed that much since the 50s. What's changed is the storage mediums mm. and the ability to stack lots of stuff and manipulate audio. But the actual sound quality of a microphone and a microphone preamp and a compressor that gets put somewhere and then we listen to it out of speakers that hasn't really, there hasn't been any great advances in that area right? since then. So there's records from the fifties that just sound incredible and you know, there you are and they just got put into a different medium and, and, uh, and now there's wars over all the mediums of like, Oh, you know, vinyl. I mean, I used to hate vinyl because your records never sounded as good as the tapes that you, you know, had. Yeah, no, that that, that would make sense. You know, I, I think it's like a, I think with that stuff, it's really it's really just kind of a a personal like kind of emotional relationship to the the medium in which you're consuming. You you know what I mean? Like it's like like going back. They made, if anything, they made speakers smaller. Now you know yeah. what I mean? Now that now people are rocking these little tiny speakers that they put on buds in their ears. <laughs> like, yeah, there's, well, there's no way to hear in bass. <laughs> the studio had, you know, I remember start out those things that look like voice of the theaters, these big yeah. Altec. So a studio would have those. And then it w wasn't until, gosh, I don't know what year it was when I started seeing small speakers. It was maybe 1970 when people started putting smaller speakers up with the big ones. And then there were, it was like what the kind of speakers you'd have in your dorm room or something, only, yeah. you know, you'd use them and AR sevens and all these, 
and then people would covet those and then that would change and finally in the early 80s the yamaha speakers came out and then all kind of speakers and now there's a wide variety of speakers to use to measure music and mix and whatnot but yeah and on the home level hard to find anyone that has a decent setup as you know it's like doctors and lawyers with Forty thousand dollar right. systems or nothing, <laughs> <laughs> and they had someone put it in for them. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so, so I yeah. Like, what were some of the groups that you were like demoing and like uh, seeing the whole process happen? Well, nothing. I can't even remember because when I got the job at Electra, my job was to listen to all the unsolicited demos, oh, and okay. then if there were somebody that was any good, they'd send me out to wherever. And I'd make a recording of them and bring it back to the bosses. And none of those ever worked out. Yeah. There were people I told them about that eventually became huge stars, but they didn't. It was funny. They had their thing and, you know, that was that, you know. And there were a lot of people I was working with that ended up doing pretty well. But Electra was sort of didn't really think any of us were any good or something, you know. So it was a funny, funny with that experience. It really was an early my, you know, you can imagine here, I make all these crazy tapes and yeah. they sign me up. And then the first thing they tell me is, well, now you can learn how to write boy, girl, me, you songs and we can make <laughs> some money. And I'm like, you know, you don't tell a 17 year old about making money. They, you know, I don't care. Yeah. You know, and so it was kind of like, what? So that, you know, that's how the whole business has been forever. It's just like, we like, we like what you do now do something else. <laughs> yeah. Is it... <laughs> Is that is that why you you didn't stick with that for so long? Is that it right there? <laughs> well, you know, um, I just at that point in my life, I had a whole lot of stuff. I mean, there was like a whole lot of things going on. I was right, never really a very, <laughs> I was never a very happy or functional kid, and I did what I did, and I was a distance runner, and I think running kind of knocked me out of the thing. I mean, the joke after all these years is like I had some kind. Of, and the reality is, I had. I was missing certain genes and I had this, all these, they're things that nobody figured out for 50 years. But, you know, it was like the only way I could experience feelings of well being was to go, you know, run 10 miles or mm. swim or do this or do that. Or, and then, um, you know, smoking weed didn't really sort of change, make that any different. That just made everything crazier. Mm. So I was just in a, I was in a different kind of, you know, anxious state for a long time. And the whole scene in Los Angeles and working in that, I just didn't like it yeah. is what it amounted to. It wasn't something I wanted to do. And I was around all these people that were very successful and famous and they were just kind of awful. I was like, I don't want to, this is, this is what this is. No, I don't want to do it. So I just left, you know, and, uh, I, I couldn't, you know, I had a deal on Warner Brothers and I just said, nope. I was going to play at Woodstock. I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went back, I went back to Indiana and then I just still playing because I didn't want to do music. It was like, it was funny and how the, the great music business thing that seems everyone's focus, especially this day and age. I mean, you're asking why is everything so different is because you know, we've had 20 years or more of just intense focus on the, you know, the flavor of the week, the flavor of the day, the flavor right. of the minute, the 15 minutes of fame are now, you know, 22 seconds or something, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so it's just, it, you know, there's no linear, there's no continuity there's just mass chaos and there's no music. How people consume music is completely different. And I have no idea how any of it works, but you know, back then I just knew that the music business was not for me. And yet I was doing music. So that <laughs> became a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it's interesting, like how much of that because it is two different worlds, you know, making music and doing the art, and then like 
the the whole business of getting getting the gig and getting it to the place where it can be recorded and shared and there's so much like that there's so much I don't know like just dirty kind of ickiness you know just that uncomfortable like money talk and like not money I get but uh, what's the word I'm looking for I think it's yeah I don't know it's to me it was like clicks and yeah social power politicized. I mean the 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 peace and love hippies of Laurel Canyon that you know are famous for writing peace and love songs and whatnot were some of the most awful power mad people I was ever, I've been around in my life you know so yeah. where does that leave you when you know the the leftish thinkish people that are being admired around the world are a bunch of slime balls in real life. That's like a hard for a for a twenty year old to handle. Yeah. And so you know, I you know, I went to Indiana, and uh, I'm not saying that my uh, ethical precepts are anything you know out of the ordinary. I'm not gonna I'm not pushing Gandhi here or something. But at the same time, you know, I was just a kid trying to do what I'm doing, and I didn't really understand the power politics of the music business, nor did I care about it. Right. And, you know, you just want to do stuff. So, yeah, so I, I started, you know, still making records and wanting. And, of course, you want to be in the pipeline and you want people to listen to it. So I continued to try to do stuff and, and play all the time. But And it was also just a big learning experience of being around a lot of people and being back in Indiana was really, uh, it was great. You know, because you, it was freeing and um, and being, you know, the Indiana in the 70s and actually America in the 70s, you know, we were still only paying like, what, I don't know what the actual number would be. Let's just say, you know, 10, 8, 10% of our income was toward housing, <laughs> which gave enormous amount of freedom to rehearse to practice to go to the movies to do this and do that and, and not just nose to the grindstone to yeah. have a roof over your head which is you know the current state of the world so yeah it was different <laughs> yeah so so like coming back when did like you hop on with the screaming gypsy bandits and like move on like when did you start producing for other people on your own well uh, you know the producing thing is becomes is what it's still like that in a sense that like uh like this you know um i still get things where i have to come in and clean it up when when because what a producer does you know ties people together organizes this and has to do with you have to be an arranger but you also have to know when to hire a re another arranger and you have to tell, you know, know when you're the person to play the guitar or hire another player. Right. Should I do all this music myself or should I get a band? Should I sequence everything? Should I play it real? You know, you have to make all these decisions. So <laughs> even back, so my experience at Electra led me to know how, I saw 10 different variations in what a producer did. So I could just organizing things and getting it done. You know, when you produce something, all it means is at the end, there's something there that you can listen to. You it's yeah. produced. It doesn't mean anything like you sat there and told everyone what to do. It doesn't mean you just did nothing and paid for it and ordered the Chinese food. You know, yeah. it, uh, it's just, um, so, I mean, I just kind of fell into this because the Scream Jitsi Bandits had just started out and I came back there to Bloomington and just fell in with the thing and started playing with them. And I can't remember, that was 69, 70. We didn't make any recordings per se, I think, till for over a year. And... Um, we tried to do some stuff I and mean, we had interesting that band got Atlantic records, heard that band and tried and wanted to sign us. And then, I mean, we made a demo for them and Jerry Wexler just hated it. And Amit, yeah. 
I had already had a weird experience with Ahmed Erdogan when I was yeah. in Los Angeles, which is too X-rated to get okay. into, and we we're not going to besmirch the man's memory over, uh, uh, you know, his. But anyway, that. <laughs> so I, you know, needless to say, I wasn't, you know, yeah, by my participation in a prank on Ahmed Erdogan, involving <laughs> the involving a. Um, artist named eve babbitts who did a lot of covers for oh, them yeah. oh. anyway there was uh, so i would that was the end of my atlantic and and all that and uh, which was funny too because one of the guys there was a an, an atlantic subsidiary called clean records that they also want to do something with me and uh, and the guy there loved it and then the Robert Stigwood was part a partner in that, and Stigwood just wanted me to, you know, get shot out of a cannon to Mars too. So <laughs> it's interesting how a lot of the that you know, whereas there'd be all these people, oh, that's great, and then the boss would be like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" <laughs> you know. Anyway, so I got I had a lot of that in my yeah. life. Like what? Uh, no. Build up so so <laughs> anyway, the bandits were like, see, I I look back on all this stuff as seeing an enormously you know, messed up uh situation where i didn't have any idea what the hell i was doing and i was just bouncing from one thing to another i couldn't you know so I, yeah. and the fact that music ties it all together but you know on a you know i was like you know living in people's like front porches and stuff it was just you know it was just a weird time yeah. and um and i you know the thing when i was in la i got in a car accident i got hit in the head really hard so throw in some brain damage and in those days if you were like and there's no uh, concussion protocol yeah it was like you know if you could if you were all right in theory they just let you out in the street again and so Jeez. basically yeah. i wasn't all right and i was never the same but uh and then it was a, the the hippie thing i got hit by this get hit by a car and they you know the cops you know not only was i broken up the cops kicked my ass even more Jeez. so and they just let me go on the street and uh you know forge my exit papers and i was wandering around what do you call that amnesia like yeah. i couldn't finally after a day or so i remembered who i worked for oh, and i went shit. to a phone yeah. booth and looked up the the guy's number and called and they thought i was joking they thought i'd been gone so anyway, I'm just trying to put this in perspective yeah, yeah. that I was not exactly a mainstream uh, youth on any level. Even even in the hippie world, I was. I was like, no, I was like some other realm, you know. And you know, so the music is one thing. So you do that, and then uh, so you know, we kept doing it. The Scream Jesse Band has kept changing because it was largely a. At first, it was a big hippie band, and then I think in my case, I wanted like more real players and that kind of right. ruined a lot of the stuff for the hippies you know who, <laughs> and uh and you know so we played then we played this we played that we, we night spring of 1970 we played in yale at the uh uh the president of yale said no black man in america can get a free trial and they had this big confab there and we played for that so we were one of those like radical hippie bands that would play those kind of things yeah and um yes. and and you know it's funny the drummer that was on that gig is currently still the drummer at the grand one of the drummers at the grand old opera oh, no way. this is how world the, you yeah. know i mean i see all these people i used to play with doing all kind of remarkable things still into their old age so you know that's kind of what you do as a you know you're a life for a musician and yeah. the shifts of life are one thing but the music you know keep doing the music that's um one well i wanted to ask about when you guys opened for beefheart and two i think that's like that bug musically that gets in you this like this thing to have to create and once you're in this like uh like kind of creative like endeavor it's interesting to see like the ones that get that life bug and like the guys that say yes to all these gigs and wind up in all these weird spots and then you see them doing the cool thing and like I know. I think that's. I think that's cool that you can see your your friend drumming and be like, "Yeah, that's awesome." And, you know, and it, it, like I think that that like kind of like seed of like being able to celebrate 
your friends still being able to do it just like how yeah. you're still doing it. You know, this like celebration is supposed to like, um, kind of like taking people down or getting seated with jealousy with like certain things like, because so well, much... <laughs> that, yeah, that whole thing, you know, God, that's like, that's so ridiculous. How could you even, yeah. You, if you're in that, if you're in that mind space, that, that head space, it's just, that's too bad because, yeah. you know, it's such a crapshoot and, and I, I was on some panel the other day and they were asking, how did you do this and do that? And I was like, oh, uh, I said, you know, by the time I got to New Orleans, I'd been washed up three times, mm. literally. Yeah. I, I mean, not washed up, but I mean, I had done this thing as a kid and gone to L.A. I was like, Poop, that was over when I was 20. Yeah. Went to New Orleans, to, back to Bloomington, did that, had screen, just Vanis, did this, did that. We, And then by 76, I was like, yeah. That's it. Enough for this. I can't be a big fish in this joint no more. It's too weird. And then, uh, and then I moved to New York and then had a nice run in New York. But then I was like, and then by, you know, uh, there I was in New Orleans, you know, doing whatever I was doing, trying to sort out what to do and start over again. So you're always, you know, there's no linear career thing ever. Right. And, you know, even people that, a lot of people that do really great and then they they screw it up somehow or just consider that you know i mean think of george harrison his manager stole 25 million dollars from him yeah even beatles weren't immune to this shit right. tom penny they, they stole all his money i, I can got uh, trent reznor I, remember I was like in new orleans and i was he had a studio there and i was you know there was a b equipment was going back and forth and la da 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 and then all of a sudden it was over. What happened? His manager built him of every cent. Trent Reznor Jeez. was broke as of what were these 2002 or something. And he, you know, he came back with it and he, he stayed in the world. But, you know, yeah. can you imagine someone stealing $30 million from you and you didn't know it? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that aspect of the thing of like looking at who's who on the pecking order on you know or the fame whore olympics or whatever you want to call it it's not you know it's like if you go there you're in you're going to be in trouble that's right. all and you well just said. and you know if you can't do it and every scene is full of that stuff there's all people that are full of uh trying to you know get to the uh clawing their way to the middle getting to the you know they get to the third floor of the skyscraper of showbiz and think there's somebody. And, you know, that's just part of this world we're in, you know? And, uh, I want to be Lizzo. That's what yeah. I want. To be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is it? Um, but, uh, but yeah, like that's a good analogy for it. Um, uh, like kind of, well, they kind of like build off of that. <laughs> like, cause it is, it is. And especially now, like with like, uh, all like I see it even just like with kids comparing themselves to other people via social media and via like right oh they're oh, doing yeah, better than I brutal. I need to do this and like so it's almost like the shitty aspect of that like I mean even though it's amplified way more when someone put getting millions of dollars out of somebody um, is kind of now focused on by just like this many people attention seeking in a way but yeah oh it's it's <laughs> it's it's way out of control. And I like, mean, obviously, you know, when you see in the politics and the whole, I mean, you know, everything is, is just completely mad at this point. I have no, I can't even begin. And, you know, the way our government is, we have, I mean, no matter what you think about politics, none of the, I mean, um, you know, the media thing, you see, <laughs> It's like the media is the government now. The half the sources on the allegedly liberal side are retired generals and retired government people. And you're like, wait a minute, I don't trust these people any more than the Ron DeSantis, you know? Yeah. So it just becomes there's nowhere to turn. Right. There's literally nowhere to turn in politics because uh, both sides are equally corrupt and yeah. one side is more obviously overt and and wacky and 
what I find interesting with all that is like, you know, I used to dabble in what we'd call, you know, performance art in back, you know, in the 70s, 60s, you know, which is not like Chris Burden putting himself in a feed sack. And, you know, I put myself in a cage yeah. downtown in Bloomington. And, you do, you know, these are kind of minimal things. But what I've discovered is a lot of the um, the right young right wing operatives and not so young now, but learned from this. And that performance art has become a, uh, a you know, in with the right, there's no more performance art with artists. Mm. It's used as a political tool, largely by, you know, right wing stuff. So that's fascinating to me, the shift in that, because, you know, so yeah, so art, music, you know, you never can tell where the stuff's going to go. Right. You don't have any control over it. And when you're making work to get likes or get money, there's there's definitely a planned obsolescence there you know sure. whether it's the universe giving it to you or whatever you think there's no way to sustain that right those people so, don't show up to the show <laughs> they don't no, come to the gig uh, <laughs> no so it's uh it's gonna it's yeah. i have no you know i mean I, I can't say my kids are like 35 and 32 and they're doing fine but this world it's like and i can't blame it you know my generation is like one of the more screwed up situations, but you know, that's been driven into the, you know, we've heard enough of that. You know, I mean, we know that the baby boomers didn't, uh, didn't deliver the goods and, and, you know, so, but still this, the new world, the last few generations haven't done any better, no matter what anybody says. Right. right. <laughs> so, <laughs> we shall see yeah for sure with that and like you know uh, i agree with like that definitely there's this performance aspect of things and it's interesting like um it's interesting like how uh, like even with plato in the republic where art right. and music was was highlighted as a, a thing to influence you know what i mean um, yeah, I'd, the part that sticks in my mind right now is like you can only play songs in Dorian mode, <laughs> like right, right, because that inspires thought and warriors. Um, but um, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is definitely an aspect of a uh, of some bigger thing to some degree. Not to conspiracize or anything, but like music can move and like and so can art. And like it's interesting as someone kind of growing up in all this and like seeing it, what it is and being on part of the ride and like, um, hearing from other people and some from generations before how much they find, like, usually it, it seems to be very emotionally, like a charged response. So to have a conversation like this, to kind of hear that, like, uh, it's also kind of like this, this uh, performance art to some degree too, you know what I mean? Like is, is really insightful or at least, you know, uh, um, inspiring to kind of like think that it's more than just like an emotional reaction from people. Oh, like, I think, yeah, no, I think so much of this stuff is purposeful. And you know, what's interesting, you know, you know, the guy writer, William Burroughs and yeah, William yeah, Burroughs yeah. wrote a book. His most influential book, I think is called the job. Mm. And essentially it's a manual of civil disobedience. And I believe that especially this used to be something that, the yippies, you know, the, the Chicago seven era kind of people, some of whom are still around, uh, would use in upping the ante of the civil disobedience as per Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King and all that world. But, uh, so it was using media and absurdity. And I believe that, you know, what's that, what I've seen happen is that, the, you know, people have taken that and it's been a purposeful, a purposeful use of this. And this also goes back to like, you know, Roy Cohen and, and this, you know, like if someone accuses you of something, accuse them of something worse. Mm. And this is, this becomes a litany that has no end. The snake bites its tail right. for eternity with that one. And I think that's kind of where we are now. So the performative aspect of everything has taken over because there's only media bites. There's no real, I mean, who gets up on Sunday and watches meet the press, you know, 42 yeah. people that are 85 or something, you know, I mean, it's not like there's no more of these. If everyone is a talking head, 
then who are the who are the pundits? The pundits don't exist anymore. They're bought and sold. So we're in a completely insane world that uh, I don't. Nobody, you know, Dolly. Nobody, you know, uh, Duchamp. Nobody in the art. Nobody thought this was going to happen. And it's just like science fiction. What did science fiction miss? The mm -hmm. personal computer. <laughs> There was always the big giant thing in the room yeah. that controlled the city. No, they missed it. it. Wasn't one damn book about a person that where everyone had a computer. Isn't that weird. <laughs> was it? So you know, yeah. you think about yeah. I mean, I think it's just incomprehensible. So this is what do I do? I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go sit and uh, you know, I'm gonna have a session and I'm gonna take a walk, go to the movies, go see my granddaughter. I'm gonna practice Yusef Latif. Uh, things um you know and uh think about what else i'm going to do but yeah. you know the the it's it, the avoidance of that world is important i think you know oh, for, yeah to, to not i mean i wish i could just fast off of news entirely but you yeah. know what we say with the screaming just man is doing political stuff it was very different we were playing and there was national guard around the stage yeah I mean, we were getting tear gas. I mean, Jeez. you know, it was that was the week the kids got killed in Kent State, and and we were, you know, it was like it was real. Yeah, it wasn't like this was like. So we, I've known that the the atrocities of the government have been, you know, in my face forever, and it has nothing to do with Democrats and Republicans or the deep state because right. the deep state is deeper than any conspiracy theorists could even imagine. And that's the weird part, you know, right. it's the deep state is beyond uh, the imagination of anyone that thinks there's pedophiles in a pizza parlor, you know. <laughs> do you um do you ever cross uh, the, numbers, <coughs> the numbers band? What is that? Uh, from Akron, Ohio, the numbers mm. band? No, the only band, the Akron bands that I worked with was were like the Swollen Monkeys. Okay. And then partly then the leftovers of like Tin Huey and. Okay, so do you know? Chris and I used Butler? to hear Tim Wright, but I didn't really know Tim Wright. I just heard him play with Ardo and in that world, you know. Do you know? Do you know Chris Butler from Tin Huey? I do. Okay, cool. Me too. But I haven't, I haven't seen him, or, and I'm trying to remember how I even know the guy. And it's probably see, I, I worked with Ralph Carney. Mm, okay. And Ralph was in that whole scene, and Ralph ended up in Waits's band and then we ended up playing with Allen Ginsberg together and then we did so we did a TV show together in the summer of 88 which was funny and there was another Ralph that was from that scene that was on that gig too but I can't remember his last name oh, yeah. um right. another at Ralph from Akron I was because uh, that's okay that's really cool I, I was talking with Chris because he was he was there during the Kent um shootings um but um on a, like on a on a different note, about this Allen Ginsberg record, like kind of building off Burroughs, what was that like, like working with him and working with music around him? Well, you know, I think Allen was was very skeptical, and we had done this movie with this guy Robert Frank, and Robert Frank convinced we wanted to do something with Allen, and Robert Frank had um, convinced. Um, Alan that Hal Wilner was okay and he should think about it. And then what we were trying to do with Alan is get him to not do his crazy poetry music where he would play the harmonium and sing those sing songy songs in yeah. that voice that, I mean, it was, I mean, it, it takes a lot to get kicked off the stage at the Rolling Thunder review. I right. mean, seriously, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's so Alan's thing. And then I guess the folklore is that Marian Faithful said, Alan, you should not sing. But I don't know if that really happened, but mm. that would be something Marianne would say for sure. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, what the concept was, let's get player composers and we'll all get Alan, Alan's book of his, at that point, it was a complete 1985, 86, complete poems book. Mm. And we'll pick out poems that we think we could score that would work. And Alan will recite them and we will make the music around it. Simple as that. Right. And it was, you know, Steve Swallow was on the gig. Mark Rebo was on the gig. 
I was on the gig for Z Bill Frizzell. Uh, can't remember everybody who was on the gig. A lot of people on the gig. And then we went. So basically, we put it together. We went in the studio, and we, Alan was in a booth. And then we, if you did a song, you'd say, okay, I want to, this band, this on this, this on this. Rebo did a few things. It was just him and Frizzell. There were things with huge, large groups. There were, uh, oh, you know, Beaver Harris from Archie Chef's band was on that gig. That was what the big thrill for me yeah. to play with Beaver Harris, who was like my hero when I was, you know, I, like Archie Chef Fire Music was a really like blew my mind when I was 19, you know. And uh, so, yeah, and that was, that was pretty, that was just a great experience. And Allen Ginsberg himself, you know, I wish the guy never would have died. I mean, he was great. He was like, you know, the dad I never had that yeah. that you could ask a question to and get a straight answer, you know. And um, and so, yeah, I I thought that was a remarkable thing, and I loved playing gigs with him. I I had one gig that somebody reminded me of the day at Tramps. It was me and Joey Barron and Allen. That was it, and it was like ridiculous, and you know, and it was just so beautiful that. And I made a piece for him that he loved for his poem, Crawl My Alice. And at one point he did, he said publicly that this was his favorite piece of music accompanying poetry that he'd ever heard. And this gave me immediate status in the post beat world or something, which of course means definitely nothing, but you know, you could say, Oh, Allen Ginsberg, he loved it. You know, I like, mean, like as if anyone cares, but you know, that, that was, but I did get invited to the, this thing they called the beat off or something about five <laughs> years ago where yeah. we, I, it was like, I played with Peter Stamfell and then the fugs played. And then the last poets, that was a pretty funny gig. And then we, I had to talk at this thing, but there were literally, more f film crews from around the world filming this thing than there were people in the audience. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that was, a, and it got, it got a big write up in the New York times. So there was like 35 people at this gig. Wow. And then there were people at the yeah. gig, the night gig, but the, the talking heads gig where yeah. you're sitting there with a pitcher of water. There's nobody <laughs> there. Nobody gave a shit. It was 2017 maybe. Yeah. So, um, as Wilner was still alive, I know that much. <laughs> and the fug and the 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 uh, last poets were openly bickering on stage, which I thought was that was the revolution was not only not televised, the revolution was now a uh, a reality show. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting, like how um something like the beat movement or like no wave. Um, like, trans, like hits later. You know what I mean? Like in the moment, like, like, like it's interesting that more cameras were there than people, like yeah. because I think a lot of people care about this and a lot of people are moved by it. But it's also the same type of people that probably aren't going to go to the gig. You know what I mean? Like I don't know what that yeah. is or like that document of that event is going to resonate later and be it's it like. It's stuff that are it's very dense and kind of heavy in a way gets digested later by listeners. Um, well, yeah, it's funny. Yes, I mean musically, some of the stuff that I've done, <clears throat> it takes like twenty five years before anybody like gets it, kind of because it's yeah. it's against the grain of the uh, of the modern of you know of the people that are all trying to sell uh, whatever you know immediate music sale. Uh, image sale to certain niche groups like because you know if i put out a record i mean it it doesn't fit with the world of dinosaur jr right. you know pitchfork they don't know what what the hell is this shit but then <laughs> it makes sense after a while and then somebody reissues it and uh, you know like this there's a record the scream gypsy bandits record from 73 yeah. is now is coming out for like the fourth time on and on vinyl pretty soon on this numero label you know so, so it's, it's funny it's like yeah. that music it lives but at the time i mean i had reviews saying that none of these songs were worth recording <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah it's like geez. what the fuck <laughs> but that's a great thing to tell a 20 year old oh Thanks. you really suck man. <laughs> yeah Stop trying to get in our club. We yeah. run this, and that was when 
See, you know, remember like major labels, when we had indie labels, we were overtly dumped on by the whole power structure of the music business. They didn't want that. Yeah. They wanted to control everything. Right. That's the way it was. So people forget this and, you know, and that, that there was, you know, an overtly political part of that world. Yeah, and but now it's anyway. politicized playlists. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's. But you, we, there, but you know? we, we were able to get on the radio, and we were able to actually compete. And the funny part is the way we lost. I had a record label, and the way we went out of business was by getting a hit and having to mm. press twenty thousand records, mm. which we probably got a thousand dollars back from the Jeez. sales because yeah. the distributors were all gangsters and they're like fuck you we're not paying your ass yeah yeah so that was yeah it was a lesson learned i mean i know like in new orleans like cosmo matassa made all these wonderful records and once he finally went into the thing and tried to you know do it himself and get on the end where he'd make some of the money and he he went bankrupt because the distributors didn't bother to pay him Mm. So that's a classic story. <laughs> yeah, but still, right? Um, yeah. Uh, to kind of build off the uh, um, Ginsburg, so like with that record, did that uh, influence the the track nineteen seventy three on this new record you have coming out? Oh, uh, well, no. I mean, I've been doing that kind of shit long. I mean, even before Alan, we were doing you know text and you know. So it, it, it not really. It was just I just had that story that was I thought That's a really good story. was k- kind of funny. It kind of like you know twists at the end the whole uh, and, and and it was like me and this guy Bill Schwartz who became Willie Schwartz. I like introduced him to Waits back in the when he needed a, a player a accordion player and yeah. Willie Willie played on that Frank's Wild Years and did the tour and then they loved each other for about three weeks and then Waits hated him and <sighs> afterwards and so uh it was funny and you know but that was like the the indiana hippies in that story was me and him and a couple other people playing <laughs> and we literally the 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 psychiatrist that read the thing was sobbing in the corner it, it, so it's actually a real story yeah. and the fucking the hippie mama going there's never too much it's really <laughs> we, i watched this happen i was like holy shit and then you know michael service is like i like working with him on anything so it was like um you know i mean have like a guy with all those tonys and who's sondheim's favorite singer and all that to do is you know, Service was in Pete Townsend's band. He's in Bob Mould's band, and and he's not really well known as a musician. But he's a great musician, and and so yeah, just having him just tell the story that, that was a good idea. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. But the the whole record is amazing, and just to end up on this track where you're just I'm fully following this like narrative, um, and like just how the music supports it. And that's why I was uh, uh, curious with the relation to the how you wrote for the Ginsburg. Um, uh, well, what that was, that was like, that was some other piece that I was doing. And my friend Tim Green, who died in 2014, maybe, and, you know, he actually, Tim died by uh, cracking his skull open. Geez. He was practicing and he hyperventilated and fell over backwards and Holy cracked shit. his head on something yeah. really hard. And then nobody found him. He didn't show up for a gig and nobody found him for two days and then he he was gone and he was kind of like not well. He wasn't, it was some, I don't know what was exactly was wrong with him, but he was a brilliant player. He was in Peter Gabriel's band. He was like, you look at the Woodstock, like 93 thing. He's in, he's the only guy that played live. Peter Gabriel was such a control freak. Everything he even sequenced Tony Levin is standing up there pretending to play. (laughs) (laughs) That's the so show. yeah so so tim so that was like uh and then i had something that was basically just a composite track where i took a bunch of things that never happened at the same time in the same place and mashed them together and then put the story on top of it i mean so it was it was no uh no high art just kind of me fucking around in the studio you know 
Well, it's the same thing that got you the gig, right? The producing gig. So yeah, right. Exactly. It's kind of like that is hard. That is high art. <laughs> well, whatever it is, but I mean, you know, I don't think it's like what you know. But now, because um, mushroom crowd, it's interesting to jump on these new records. It's interesting how the um, the I don't know which one precedes the other because Howard sent both them to me. Um, I don't know if one came before. But Mushroom Crowd compared to, um, well, I can't think of the ballot one. Mushroom Crowd is after, after <laughs> Gooseneck. Gooseneck. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> it just, like, it just, I just broke the words apart. But it's actually, you know, it's from that one song where the, uh, it's actually, you know, I took the text from Gooseneck. Rabelais. Yeah. yeah, I took the text from, uh, you know, um, Gargantua yeah. and just made a song out of it. And then the guy... You know, he likes to he likes to take the neck of a goose and stick it in his ass, you know. So that was like that's why it's called it's good. that's the name of the record. Goose neck. It's like it has, has a very overtly stupid reference in that you'd have to dig out in the yeah. song to figure out. But that's what it is. That whole I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean I was trying to make these, you know, it was like I had this fling of making uh uh what I was thinking of you know, working with Michael Servus and he, I went to see him in like Avita and some other things and, and, you know, with Ricky Martin and so it was funny. And so I was thinking about how I always never liked musicals, but I liked, and I didn't like Andrew Lloyd Webber, but I actually had fun watching Avita and seeing the whole thing and the spectacle and the staging. And, but musicals always were like, I was like, ah, I can't take this shit, you know? And that was one of the few musical yeah. forms so I said, what if I, what if you could do the whole thing and it only lasted like five minutes? I'd really, I'd dig it. So that was like uh, Gargantua mm. and the other one, The Long Hangover. Those are, I, I, those are all musicals that lasted the length of uh, my attention span for a musical. It's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's interesting um, that you say that because listening through, like I'm trying to follow these, these movements and these, these chord changes. And that's the thing that came to my mind was like, it's kind of musical esque in which how like certain lines and narrative parts are like brought out. So that's incredible. Like that definitely carries through. Um, Cause like w with all your work, like it's not, it's, it's not just, it's not just A, B, A, B, like, which is very refreshing, but it's going all over the place. Um, so like, so that's, that's super interesting to hear that those few tunes, that was the, the goal with it. So now with, with these two records in particular, um, you said they recorded at different times and they're just being put out now or was well, this yeah, like uh, well, yeah, they were recorded um, like the, most of the gooseneck stuff was like before I left New Orleans in 2014, and then I finished it out in the in the country. But I think most of that was done like six, seven years ago, and then uh, Mushroom Crowd fig finished like that's probably 2017 or 18. You know, it's hard to say. I just put arbitrarily put numbers on there. Yeah. Uh, but some of them I, you know, worked on four months ago and remixed or something. But you know, essentially, I'm trying to just give a time frame to any of this, you know. Right. Which sometimes they don't like that, and you know, they want to pretend everything is ever modern. But I don't give a shit if people know when it was made, you know. Well, I, 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 I think that kind of, you know, because like it sometimes it takes forever to finish a thing. You know what I mean? Like, right. Especially when it's just like is moving it like as far as like musically as as moving and structured as your music is like it's like i'd it it's i feel better knowing that it wasn't just put together yesterday <laughs> holy shit <laughs> like uh to be like someone who's trying to write songs and stuff and come up with bits like to get a verse course is hard enough you know within like an, an hour or something and like <laughs> So I'm glad yeah, well, to hear it wasn't all just put together yesterday. Thank you. No, I mean, you know, I mean, you can sit down and write a song and, you know, adhere to the, we're going to make a little intro or we're yeah. going to start cold or we're going to, and it's, you know, the Nashville thing. It has so many syllables and then it's going to go here and then the chorus has to repeat and then it's going to go up a half step and then, you know, all that, you know, I mean, this is like if you're if somebody if somebody that you really like comes in and they you're going to work on their stuff and you might go help them get their songs have a bump to them and make it easier for the rest of us to hear yeah. and more fun and all that shit but 
you know, so that's when you use those kind of, you know, overt composition techniques and, and, and otherwise it's more fun to just to find where something is supposed to go. Cause you know, that's more mysterious and you don't really know, but you know, it's, it's easy enough. Like, you know, I play a lot of gigs where, I mean, I just played some gigs where, you know, I listen to the song, I listen to it down. I write it down as it goes by. I think about what I might play and then I go and then I play it Mm. in front of human beings and don't mess it up. Yeah. So, you know, you have the ability to do that, but that, you know, doesn't mean that you write, you know, it doesn't give you a leg up on anything. And it's just, that's, that's what you're supposed to do as a musician, right? Right. right. <laughs> that's, what that's what you're supposed to be able to do. So when you, when you work with somebody that's like a singer songwriter kind of person, then you can help them maybe flesh out some of these things that they don't really get why they don't know that you know, a C and an A minor are the same thing, except, right. you know, when you put your finger there, you, you see that high A on there, that makes it into a A minor, but it's, take the A away and it's a C. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, literally, you deal with a lot of people that are really talented and do really great music and they have no clue right. why that is. And so, and recently doing stuff like, you know, the, the Gil Evans drop two kind of arranging stuff, mm. It's fascinating, and you just think, but you know, you how something so astounding is what sketches of Spain and miles ahead and all that, and you can, but you can break it down to like, oh, that's what they did. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's like a. It's a. Victor Wooten's got a good way of putting it. Like it, it's theory is easy, you know. The like it's it's described complica- complicated, but like when you really look at why it works oh physically you just move that you know yeah and like so you've got a c major seven and you and you suddenly you got it in the first position and suddenly you take the next one you put the g on the bottom right and then you keep moving that second note from the highest down and and have somebody just have a section play that and every change every other bar you're like holy shit that's Sounds it. like Debussy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's like, and all he did was do that. So it puts wow. the it puts the play back in music. It's just like you Well, know. yeah. And I mean, yesterday I went crazy. I was hearing uh I was hearing Mozart G minor symphony, and I just was like, this is fucking <sighs> and then the the DJ gets on, there's a Nashville classical station that's yeah. really great and plays all kind of uh contemporary people that you'd never hear on mo- most classical stations play top 40 classical but this the nashville classical station is astoundingly good for hearing new stuff anyway i was just thinking and then the dj comes on and goes people say mozart wrote this for posterity but actually he was in dire need of money and he got money from a casino to write this and i was like oh gee there is opening a casino in vienna and <laughs> It's like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> Not it's as funny. Cool. And it was like it's <laughs> one of his greatest pieces, you know, to me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know ah, what yeah. a what a piece. Yeah, and uh, it's like, damn. Yeah, sometimes sometimes context or lack thereof keeps you know I don't know James Brown's music still good or you know what I mean like <laughs> yeah, but James Brown is just like that. Sh- that shit'll never. I mean yeah. his. Uh, yeah, it's like, I've got a cassette of, it's like 70s stuff. It's not even the great stuff. It's just vamping, you know, yeah. star power that era and, uh, with hell on it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it's still great. You know? <laughs> I mean, it just, even when he was like starting to not, I mean, you know, when yeah. he, he would like, when the band was taking acid and then James would like, Said I want some of that, and he'd take acid and do nothing but run the stage for an hour and a half, and only vamped, and the audience was like, "The hell!" <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to, to build off of, I guess, build off of that was like um, working with guys like John Schofield. Were were any moments like that with with a guy like that where theory or like kind of uh, playing became like less mystified? Uh, well. If if it wasn't for Schofield, I don't think I would have like a career on a certain level. Yeah. Because of his help. 
I mean, I already had a career before I met him, but you know what I mean? It's like the, when I, when Wilner said, gave me a chance to do a song, do a, a monk song on that monk record called the way that's the way now. I feel now. Yeah. And so I always want to do brilliant corners and I learned it, but I could not get the bridge. <laughs> So I asked Schofield if he wanted to play on it, and he was like, "Oh yeah, yeah." And I gave him the idea, and the idea was like, "This is like the Ventures meet Messian. Let's use the Messian thing of where Messian had, you know, you'd have, you know, da 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 da, and then you should also have that be able to go against itself, go ba da 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 da, or ba da 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 da, or da 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 da." All those should fit together, and if they didn't, you'd move a half step to make it sound all, you know, glorious. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that's basically, you know, you want to teach Messian. There it is in a nutshell. Uh, but uh, so it's like, okay, let's do the Messian on the front of it, and you know, and Swallow will play. Swallow will solo, and we're going to play it in quarter time, and Joey's going to play it in half time, and Swallow's going to solo over it. And then we're going to go into half time and then we're going to play it in full time and then that's it and there's no solo so it's like oh that's great and so that was the arrangement and Schofield ta taught me how to play he taught me how to finger the bridge which is not easy for guitar especially I'm not a bebop guitar player I'm sure your average bebop guitar player can play it in their sleep but it wasn't that easy for me and then I got it and you know without him doing that what would have happened I don't know. <laughs> and then there was a thing I was working with James Taylor on a song and the James Taylor's music director hated what I was doing. And, and Schofield was on the gig and Schofield mediated and moved the voicings in a way that this guy, Don Grolnick would uh, approve of. And I was really trying to radicalize. I didn't want the Don Grolnick Muzaki you know, shower the pee, where every voicing moved, you know, like it, as minimally from one to the next. You know what I mean? You know what yeah. I'm talking about when yeah. everything is, uh, it's very seamless. Right. And and perfect and beautiful, which I, you know, I, I love and I love James Taylor. That's why I was like, but I didn't want to do for this Hal record. I did not want to do a James Taylor record. I wanted right. to do something slightly. So when... I, it were a lot of substitutions and a lot of weird stuff that made that were the disjunct kind of things that a, a great jazz guy would like give me. I was used to this, like Mac Rev and that looking at me out of the corner. I was like, really? <laughs> you know, so I mean, you know, you get used to this after a while. The, yeah. the real musicians, quote unquote, giving you shit for the dumb shit that you want to do. And um, so Schofield, you know, he navigated that one for me. And that you know so it's just been always been very much of a help with things and he played on my solo record in 85 86 whenever that was that didn't come out till 89 and mm -hmm. and he did some great stuff on that and, and that sort of predated his right he rocked out on those things which he didn't really do again until yeah. the stuff with modesky and all them so you know He's an incredible, incredible musician. Um, and yeah. that's, one, that's, that's super cool to hear that the personality matches with the musicianship. You know what I mean? Like willing to help like land the point with you and like, and, and explain things, you know, like with, with someone of that caliber, you know, it, it, to like be able to be like, it's this, and then you're going to move it up half step. Like those are bits. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that passage there was just like the fuck yeah well any plot it. lines ridiculous you know but yeah. there's got to be it's it's chromatic and there's got to be like uh there's got to be a, a simple a simple switch to it you know it's just finding that switch with in all this like noise of sound <laughs> like yeah but that that's amazing so um the kind of like it had to be a trip to go all the way back to a to starting with Monk, right? Having your dad play Monk and then like yeah. being able to work on this like this tribute to Monk, like yeah, well it was it was fun. It was great to be in the room and see like you know see Doctor John and Elvin Jones play together. Holy yeah, shit! Wow. And um and then have Charlie Rouse and Steve Lacey were there when I was cutting my track and they were like 
they were laughing. They just could not believe this particular take on Monk, you know. So that that made me real happy. And Charlie said that Monk would have liked this better than yeah. any track on the record. <laughs> and he said just because it wasn't imitating him, right? You know, and it used his thing. And so yeah, but that song, Brilliant Corners, that record, Brilliant Corners, with Ernie Henry on alto and stuff. That's always been one of my fave records. It's a Riverside Monk record from what is fifty six, fifty seven. Really great stuff. That's incredible. That's that's you know that's that's praise from, you know you got Monk and Ginsburg. Ginsburg. That's 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 a that's a uh, well Monk was dead already. Right. He, this was Charlie extrapolating on Monk, what Monk would have. But you that's know I close. mean I saw Monk at the five spot with you, you know ten other twenty. Yeah, I saw Monk a bunch, but yeah, there's hardly anyone ever there. These were like poorly attended gigs in the East Village, like you know at the corner of St. Mark's and and Bowery, you know. And I saw Monk, I don't know, I saw him a few places, and I saw Mingus. I got to see, I was slightly too young to, I miss Coltrane, oh. but I saw a lot. I saw Archie Sheppel. Archie, I, I have friends that still play with Archie, and he lives in France. It's like, yeah. I've never met Archie Shep, but he's always like one of my heroes. But, um, you know. That's in, like, it, that goes back to that kind of like, it's, it's richness is only discovered later, you know? So that's incredible. Did you get the like you get the bug mug at all? Did you get to pick his brain a little bit? No, no. I never I was like a kid frozen in a chair watching him play. Yeah. I never and never went and talked to them. No, I was too scared to talk to them. Did you check out with the record? Like you you've grown up hearing him, so seeing him live, did that pan out? Was it like what you thought it would be? You know, just Oh yeah. No, yeah? no, it was great. Yeah, no. It was great. Except it was interesting that he played some stuff that i never would have thought he would play but i can't remember what that was at this point yeah. where one time i went to see archie shep and he played only christmas carols and i thought that was weird <laughs> that is weird and, and <laughs> no that was that was rasan i went to see oh, rasan okay, okay. and he played christmas carols and archie i went to see archie expecting some crazy shit and he played all ellington and i was like hmm. i don't know you this duke yeah. ellington you know and now know. i'm like oh god <laughs> you know i was like i, I you know yeah, take the a train that's why you play with kids that can't play fuck that <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> uh, true yeah mark thank you so much for your time man this has been a wonderful conversation and i really enjoyed diving into your music and your career and uh this is a i really much enjoyed this talk so thank you my friend thank you and uh yeah it's great it was good awesome <laughs> Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig Podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.